Hi, Joel. This is my first time writing to you, and since this is a very sensitive topic in my old hometown, I'd rather remain anonymous if that's okay with you. I had a friend back in elementary school, not my closest friend, but we moved in the same circles, and at one point she invited me over to her house for a sleepover. I was only too happy to accept, it sounded fun. But little did I know it was a night that would have some seriously far-reaching implications. So this friend of mine, we'll call her Annie, lived with her mom and stepdad. They seemed like nice enough folks and their place was nice enough, but I guess a lot of us come to learn as we grow older, appearances can be deceptive. On the night of the sleepover, her mom wasn't due home until later in the evening. This meant that we were in the care of my friend's stepdad and because of our bedtime, we weren't likely to see her mom until the following morning. This was no big deal to me at all, but it was to my friend, who kept bringing it up at odd moments while we were playing. It also became increasingly obvious that she didn't really like her stepdad at all that much, which I guess is about par for the course for some children of divorce, so I didn't really read into it all that much. But then came bedtime. We got into our PJs, brushed our teeth, and went back to Annie's bedroom to climb into bed. I asked if she had a nightlight or anything and went to turn off the bedroom's main light, but she stopped me, telling me that her stepdad would be up soon to check on us. Only when he made sure that we were tucked in bed would we be allowed to turn the nightlight on and talk for a while. It seemed like a weirdly strict way of doing things, but I figured that I better just respect their systems, so I lay down on the blow-up mattress that they'd put down for me and got tucked in. I remember talking to Annie about something. I can't remember what exactly, but the conversation took this sudden turn when, out of nowhere, she said, I'm real glad you're here tonight, Sarah. Thank you for sleeping over. I guess from how it looks on paper, that sounds like a pretty wholesome moment, right? But that just makes me wish y'all could actually hear Annie saying those words, because the way her voice sounded gave them a distinctly unsettling feel. It was almost like my presence was going to prevent something bad from happening and at the time, I figured that bad thing was just Annie being lonely on a Friday night. She also wasn't the most popular girl around and I think it played on her insecurities so it made sense that our friendship meant a lot to her. But in truth, there was a whole other reason she was glad I was there. I remember me and Annie hearing her stepdad walking up the stairs and her swiftly laying back in bed with the covers up to her chin. Now looking back on it, there was a kind of military precision to it. Annie seemed nervous, like she was focused to pass some kind of inspection, which is exactly what I assumed was going on. I figured if her stepdad was that strict, I'd better do her a solid and just act likewise, so I did. I lay back down on the blow-up mattress and pulled the covers up to my chin. Annie's stepdad then walked into the room and instead of carrying himself like some drill sergeant, he seemed perfectly warm and friendly, just like he'd been all evening. Then he walks over to Annie's bed to take a seat on the edge and leans in to give her a goodnight kiss. Only instead of a quick peck on the cheek or forehead before standing up again, he lingers a little too long after the kiss itself. It didn't strike me as being wrong or anything, just weird. Then, as he started to whisper something to Annie, she said aloud, I want to talk to Sarah. I remember thinking, so talk to me, I'm right here. Like the whole situation just seemed really off to me for some reason and I couldn't figure out why. I knew different families did things differently. I guess I was just too naive to recognize something that would have seemed obvious if I'd seen it today. So as I'd said, Annie had thrown out some vague ultimatum which signaled her stepdad to leave. He shifted a little, looked back at me for a moment with a smile, then turned back to start whispering something to Annie again. She cuts him off even more assertively that time, saying, Dad, I want to talk to Sarah, please. There was a brief pause, and then he said, Okay, sweetie. And after that, he finally left the room. Like I said, I knew that I'd just witnessed something significant, I just didn't know what but the vibe in the room afterwards was very intense. Annie stayed quiet for a long time. Then when she finally spoke, she said that same heartwarming, turn creepy kind of thing. I'm glad you're here tonight, Sarah. Thank you for sleeping over. I didn't sleep over at Annie's house again. 
I think she knew that her stepdad had kind of creeped me out that night, but we stayed friends for the remainder of elementary school, and she even came over to play for a few times during the summer after graduation. Sadly, our friendship was basically doomed because we were headed for different middle schools once summer break was over. We kept in touch for a little while, but by the end of that first year, we had all but drifted apart completely. Over the next two years or so, I saw Annie around town a number of times. We were always happy to see each other, but the final few times that we bumped into one another, Annie had started to look increasingly unwell. She didn't look like she was eating or sleeping very much but insisted that she was fine when I asked her. I just wished her all the best, then carried on shopping for track shoes with my mom. About four months go by, and I don't see or hear anything of Annie. And then, probably the most infamous crime in our town's recent history occurred. My mom broke the news to me, how a man had killed his wife, his kid, and then took his own life before setting fire to the family home. I grew up in a real quiet mountain town, maybe only 3,000 people altogether, the kind of place where someone running a stoplight was gossip-worthy. Nothing ever happened there, so for something so awful to happen out of the blue, it rocked people to their very foundations. When mom told me, I remember feeling awful for the wife and kid while wondering what the hell had gone so badly wrong in a man to make him something so unspeakable. But that wasn't the worst part. My mom knew who the family was. The kid that got killed was Annie, and her killer was her own stepfather. I was devastated, beyond devastated really, and it hit me harder because I felt like I'd known that he was bad. He acted all friendly and warm on the outside, but what I saw in Annie's room that night was a glimpse of a man he really was. Like I said, someone older might have been able to piece it together, but I just didn't have the emotional toolkit, so to speak, to do so, and in my mind, that meant Annie's death kind of felt partially my fault. I couldn't say that, though. I just bottled it all up, knowing that even if I had said something, nothing would have happened. It's not illegal to be a little strict or weird. That was my thinking anyway, but as I came to learn, that's not quite how the law works when it comes to kids. I should have said something, that's the moral of the story really, and it's just as much a warning to others as it is a lesson to myself. If I'd have raised the alarm, even if it was voicing some minor concerns about the way any stepdad acted with her at night, that would have gotten the ball rolling, meaning there was a good chance someone would have gotten around to asking him a few questions. And if that certain someone had been a three-letter agency, and they'd look through his computer they'd have found a Pandora's box of vile, indecent images. Annie's stepdad was abusing her. He had been for years, and he's been documenting it too. Neighbors heard a whole bunch of shouting just before the murders and were right about to call the sheriff when they heard the first few shots. They said it sounded vicious, the argument, I mean, and that they were pretty sure someone was smashing things in between yells. It's not 100% clear, but people generally agree that the fight occurred after Annie's mom found the pictures or videos or whatever it was on her husband's computer. The way I imagine it is that all the smashing was either him smashing phones or him trying to stop Annie's mom from getting to one so she could call the cops. Then, when Annie's stepdad realized that there was nothing he could do or say to get Annie's mom to stop or calm down, he grabbed his gun and shot her, Annie, and then himself after trying to destroy the evidence. He probably would have been successful if their neighbors hadn't heard the gunshots because the cops that arrived on scene quickly summoned the fire department who put out the blaze and preserved all the digital evidence in the process. The whole thing didn't come out for months and months afterwards, which I guess was a deliberate decision to try to keep people from freaking out too hard. But all it really did was divide all the grief and outrage into two parts. Hearing that Annie was being abused reignited the whole thing and had this big black cloud hanging over the town that never really went away. Me and my own family ended up moving out of town about two years later and I did my final couple years of high school someplace else. When people figured out where I'd moved from, they kept asking if I'd known the girl who had been murdered by her stepdad. I used to lie and tell them I didn't. But every time they asked, I'd have to find an excuse to take a quiet moment in order to fight back the tears. I felt horrifically guilty for a long, long time too. 
and it took a therapist to get me to understand that it wasn't my fault. But even so, I know there's a small part of me that will always feel partially responsible. It's all just a case of keeping that part's voice, the one that tells me it's all my fault, as quiet as possible. If you enjoyed this scary story, listen to thousands more, either over on the Let's Read YouTube channel or podcast.